This morning's message comes from the Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 7, verses 15 through 20. Matthew, chapter 7, verses 15 through 20. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, you will recognize them by their fruits. This is God's word. Thank you for being a part of this coming and being a part of this worship service to the glory of God. We uh, want to thank Phil for preaching last week. And after the Sermon on the Mount, we will advance into uh, exegesis regarding the book of Ecclesiastes. And the central verse is found in chapter 12, where you say the summary verse, verse 13, which reads the end of the matter, all has been heard. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. So that'll be coming after we go done with the Sermon on the Mount, and uh, we will exegete section by section and present. Last time together, we walked through the text, Matthew 7, 12 through 14. We asked the question, this question we asked of the text, what attitudes can keep a Christian strong in a wicked age? And after examining the text, we found a Christian can remain strong in a wicked age by embracing a couple of things through the Holy Spirit alone, rule, that is golden rule, and lifestyle, that is narrow versus broad living. Notice the power of contrast. This is what uh, we've said it before and we'll say it again. You see it in the text. Very important to hold to. Today in the Sermon on the Mount, chapter 7, verses 15 through 20, which was just read by our dear Pastor Joel, we have contrast again. First, we want to note how the text is put together. You have verse 15 leading up to a phrase which says, and you will recognize them by their fruits. And then go down to verse 20, thus you will recognize them by their fruits. Uh, this encapsulates the title of the message. In other words, you know what? How do we determine false uh, prophets? Jesus affords this to the first hearers and readers and to the church subsequently. So here is where we derived our uh, textual question and um, <clears throat> the title. This is how we did it. You look for clues in the word of God itself. So, and again, we also have contrast. You have false prophets which can only be defined if there exist good prophets, true prophets. We said before that we can't really define evil properly unless there is good. And so the presence of good, the presence of true prophets is how we define bad and how we define false prophets. And Jesus uses contrast here today to the glory of the Father and our benefit. So, given this, and given what we said about verse 20, this is verse 20 and verse 16, here we have, there is one main point, but we'll have two others affixed to it. And these are important as well. But the central point is from verse 16 uh, through 18. Having observed the text, then we proceed to our question. What things should the church know? about false prophet. What things, plural, should the church know about false prophets? We've had our share, we've encountered false prophets as a church before, 
We've had to deal with false theology. We've had to deal with it by uh, church discipline. We've had to deal with it by confrontation, and we trust in a loving manner. We've had to do it. Uh, just dealt with an individual completely off the wall uh, this past week and uh, found out by speaking with a brother in Cambridge recently, Pastor Randy, speaking together face to face. We were talking about there is a this group apparently going about seeking to divide churches. Well, we talked about how we will handle that, keep each other informed. We know how they operate. And today, this will help us. This will help us. What things should the church know about false prophets? One of the roles of, uh, of an elder is to investigate. Not we read Bible, think, pray, seek the Lord. We also study good volumes, but get into the community and look under rocks and behind trees. What's going on? What's this? How might that affect the church? So we're going to deal with an answer to that question. What thing should the church know about false prophets? We'll do that today. So we'll trust in the Holy Spirit now. Let's pray. Father, I cannot do this. <clears throat> this you know. I know it. Unless by the Holy Spirit. And by the Holy Spirit, if I say something, it will be good. If not, it will fall to the floor. And I pray that you would filter out those bent things such that the people of God would receive only that which you want me to say. And Lord, help me. I believe in the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Help us now as a church to keep alert in this age of great evil. Show us how to respond to false prophets and to do so well to your glory. We ask all of this in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Throughout the history of the church, we read that the ecclesia has been plagued by false prophets. False prophets, not almost good false. For instance, in the early 300s AD, a man named Arius, Arius who was sort of the the father of modern uh, Jehovah's Witnesses and other cults. Arius taught that the sun was created and was therefore not truly divine like the father. Dangerous. And it found its way into the visible church and began to spread. In the early 400s AD, a man named Pelagius taught that human sin is not inherited from Adam. Said, oh, no, that didn't happen. Augustine took exception and battled him. And he went on to say that everyone is free to act righteously or sinfully and that there were people who lived uh, completely without sin. I've never met anybody like that, have you? Uh-uh. Can you imagine? But I've run into people who have said to me, you were propagating that doctrine of perseverance of the saints. I believe that you can lose your salvation. And my, answer, uh, my opinion is very clear. I said, if you ever, um, you're pretty confident of your salvation. It seems to me that you're doing pretty well. That means you're probably without sin. Oh, uh, uh. I got one chap so angry, he yelled at me, and I said, you just lost it, buster. <laughs> Done. End of issue, go away. It's a good thing that Jesus loves us in spite of our warts. <clears throat> so that was Pelagius. In the modern era, there are numerous examples of false prophets. There are just two I'll just observe. Bishop Spong, Shelby Spong. From 1979 to the year 2000, he was the Bishop of Newark in New Jersey. Shelby um, rejected numerous Christian doctrines. 
fully supported the LGBTQ plus movement within the church and argued that the church must go along with the world if we're going to get anywhere as a religion. <coughs> we, we must needs go along with the world. We must be, ever hear this word? We must be, do you know it? Tolerant. We must be in line with the culture. We must be relevant. We have to be relevant. <laughs> I remember talking to a guy. I shouldn't have done this. A guy brought this up at a conversation. He said, what are you talking about? Irrelevant? Is this like this? Shouldn't have done that. <laughs> Not a good thing. Had to back up on that. There's another, another interesting one. This is, comes from, this is a movement. Radical feminism movement has been a major problem. Listen to this quote by a professor of clinical psychology, probably not a Christian, out of Ottawa, Canada. She's sort of a, a compatriot in a sense with uh, Jordan Peterson, who comes from Canada as well. Her name is Janice Fiamengo. Janice Fiamengo. Is, uh, certainly stands up for the rights of women. But she wrote this recently regarding the radical feminist movement which has invaded the culture. Listen to this, I think it's very insightful. Radical feminism functions on the ideology of collective vengeance. Did you ever hear that? Collective vengeance, well put. It operates on the ideology of collective vengeance. Notice the word collective and it's linked to social or cultural Marxism and vengeance. You see this with other applications as well. I've seen it written lately in some of the literature against men. Uh, I am a white man and uh, by virtue of birth, God did that, but I'm toxic apparently. Oh well. Here I stand in my toxicity, firmly trusting in Jesus. But this kind of collective vengeance is what Marxism uses to divide people and to get people to hate each other. But it is the gospel who brings us together, whether you're white or black or whatever. We come together under the banner of Jesus and we love each other to his glory. Janice Fiamengo pointed out the radical feminist movement and its danger and it has ripped up relationships and families and churches and is still doing it. False, prof false prophets, false movements abound. So in our text, Jesus warns the people of God in all ages of the threat of false prophets. He warns his people to know certain things about them. We have to be warned. So what things should the church know about false prophets? There are just three of them. The main one is point two. The main one's point two. So we want to take a look at the text. Turn to the text, Matthew 7, verse 15. We're going to go down through verse 20. This is where, if you think about uh, the, the surging of water, you think it begins with the trickle and then it gets to a torrent. We were at the headwaters of the Mississippi this past week, and, and it was great. Um, there it is, headwaters in Itasca State Park. Took a picture and everything. Um, but eventually it becomes a huge river. Well, this is the, the uh, Sermon on the Mount begins with this, the beauty of the Beatitudes, and it just starts flowing, and then it picks up speed as Jesus reaches the peak, and it's coming. And uh, this is a heavy passage, but next week, this is, it is a churning text, and we're going to see that. But this is too. What should the church know about false prophets? The church should know that false prophets are disguised. They are disguised like sheep. Verse 15, beware of false prophets who come to you, speaking of the believers, in sheep's clothing, 
but inwardly are ravenous wolves. What does ravenous mean? It means hungry, a desire to have what they want. They don't care about you. They don't care what happens to you, but they care what happens to them. So they're going to use you to get what they want. Pause. Now some explanation. These false prophets identify themselves as believers and truth bearers. They come into churches, they come into the visible church, and they say, well, I'm a truth bearer. I have a robe on. However, their hearts are moving in the opposite direction. I read an article two weeks ago about a chap who was arrested. He was wearing a uniform of a peace officer, but uh, inside he certainly wasn't a man of peace. He was stealing money and this kind of thing. Has happened before. Well, this is very much like these people. They tend to use believing terms, yet they distort the meanings. It's like uh, this issue a long time ago with Bill Gothard. Gothard said, I believe in grace, but if you read his definition, he does not. I believe in the gospel. No, you don't. You redefine the terms, man. So we don't go after that. They distort the meanings. They may even have long flowing robes and academic standing. Nothing wrong with academic standing as long as you love Jesus. Yet they are opposed to the truths taught by Christ. Shelby Spong, rejecting everything orthodox. Boom, get it out of my sight. Still a bishop, drawing a big salary, a wolf in sheep's clothing. Such wolves attack in the modern era uh, uh, these doctrines, and not just these, but I'm just going to highlight them. Scriptural inspiration and authority. Scriptural inspiration and authority, they attack that. They attack also the exclusivity of Christ. I remember a meeting. It wasn't a denominational meeting. It was a broad meeting of various church leaders sitting around this table, and a chap said, there are more ways to heaven than by Jesus. This is a guy who was a pastor of a church. And I said to him with all politeness, no. Ever hear of Acts 4.12? And I think I've told you before, he looked at me and said, I didn't even know that was in the Bible. Leader of a church. Oh, how good. So I said to him, well, that's wrong and that's false. So anyway, I didn't go back. It was quite a meeting. Exclusivity of Christ. No other way but by Jesus. That's it. How about the truth of the image of God? There are only two genders. What are we up to now? 83 and counting? Mm. That's a rejection of the image of God, the Imago Dei. You see, what cultural Marxism is, is it's a religion of Satan. And you notice how it opposes everything that God upholds. That's what it does. How about this? The reality of hell. Oh, no, when we die, we just, we're just done. That's it. That's it. That's it. Or you have those who say to us, oh, I'm going to go to hell and all my buddies and I will have a big party. That's not going to happen. When you go to hell, if you reject Jesus, you will certainly go to the lake of fire. We'll have more on that in a moment. So then <coughs> false prophets are disguised like sheep, yet they're wolves with a wolf-like agenda to destroy they may come with a smile, just the sweetest people. Oh, and if an elder opposes them, then you're mean-spirited. Uh, stop it. And, uh, but you have to keep going. It's no game. And by the way, when you start opposing these people, guess what happens? You get attacked. And you can't sleep. Two or three o'clock in the morning, you're awakened. Right? Right? <laughs> And you feel this pressure, boom, on top of you. Why? Because darkness hates what you're doing. Mm -mm, mm -mm. But we keep praying. They're disguised. So what do we do? We pray for boldness to confront wolves in this present darkness. Elders especially hold the line. 
Such can be dangerous and costly. Sheep often think the worst of those who desire to defend them. Pray for church leaders. Pray for each other. Every Christian is a minister of the gospel in some sense. So pray for each other. Error can enter into families. It can enter into churches. It can enter into individuals. We don't want that. Lord, help us. Lord, help us. So what should the church know about false prophets? First of all, disguised. <laughs> they look like sheep for a little while. <clears throat> Secondly, though, they are detectable. Detectable. We can find them out. Verses 16 through 18, read. You will recognize them by their fruits. Ah, what does that sound like? This. You will recognize them by their fruits. Verse 20. Okay, let's look in between. Let's see what we find. Now he gets very, very detailed. You will recognize them by their fruits. That is what they do. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Question. So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Pause. Verses 16 through 18. Jesus tells us here that false prophets can be detected. Oh, yes, they can be. First, one identifies a false prophet by what they produce. They resist, ultimately, God's word, his true messengers, and biblical correction. They won't be corrected. Uh-uh. You press on a false teacher, somebody who's under the influence of a false teacher, and what do they do? They try to have it over on you. <clears throat> And they try to get parties to oppose you within the ecclesia. It's a war. So, secondly, although they can deceive for a season, they cannot hide their hearts for long. Here it is the truth. Thorn bushes apparently bear small dark berries that resemble grapes at a distance. So if we look through a telescope at these people, we say, boy, they look like sheep. And I heard them talk about grace. Yeah. So that guy must be true. But they cannot hide their hearts for long. Why? Because when you get up close, you realize, hey, wait a minute. These are thorn bushes, and those aren't grapes. They're just berries, not the same. And those things we thought were figs from thistles? Nope. No. So, there you have it. Third, true prophets are healthy. They're tested over time. True false prophets are diseased. They produce bad fruit. It's bad for the body. It's like poison. True and false prophets stand in stark contrast with each other. False prophets will enter into a body and will change it. And if that body goes after the false prophets, ultimately they will be destroyed. We see this with churches. Churches with, uh, I was talking to a student who was telling me, that uh, near this particular university that there is a church down the road with a big LGBT flag flapping and the, you know, the new transgender flag and all this stuff. And we welcome all in the love of God. <clears throat> what baloney that is. That's not Christianity. That's a lie. And uh, what is happening to that church is it's turned into a den of wickedness. Not a church. It's Ichabod. The poison introduced by this kind of evil will destroy, and guaranteed it will destroy lives. Again and again, false prophets move in and take down, but they can be detected. They can be. Look at their fruit. Get up close. Be patient, but get up close. And by the Holy Spirit, examine. And know, as you start tasting of what they afford, as their doctrinal meal, you'll find this is awful. This doesn't go down well. I went to a conference of this, this Gothard character just to check him out. And I sat there and I looked at the doctrine of grace 
and I looked at what this clown was saying, a clownus clowny, meaning odd teacher, and, and I thought to myself, this is making me sick. This is ill. Didn't take long to figure out, as other, other people, other sound scholars said, this is dark, licentious, deal with it. So you're talking about a grave darkness. This is poisonous, and it will destroy lives. It just tears them up. So pray for a growing discernment with respect to true and error. That's our first application. Pray for a growing discernment with respect to truth and error. Pray for patience. One does not want to call a weak Christian a wolf. They could just be weak. And so we encourage them to know the truth. But eventually, if they push back and fight, we know they're really a wolf. So that's the second one. Where have we so far? What should the church know about false prophets? They're disguised and they are detectable. We can find them out. Another one, one more, and then we move to applications, then to a hymn, presentation of our membership candidates, and then Reverend Phil will close us in prayer. So here we go. Last one, verses 19 through 20. We've talked about 20 already. Thus they will recognize them by their fruits. So just ahead of that verse, what do we have? Verse 19, what does it say? It sticks to the main message as the first verse does, okay? Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Whoa. So what's, what's the last word? Disguised, detectable, and doomed. Why do we follow that? Why do people follow false prophets when they are doomed? It's like this. Beautiful highway, sign up, bridge is out. Keep driving. Oh, it's such a beautiful highway. It must get better. Oops, we're in the drink. Bad move. They're doomed. Listen to this. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Judgment language. Fire. It can mean <coughs> it can mean presence or majesty, but it has this judgment component to it. Jesus declared that false prophets, unless they repent, will be cast into hell. This is the place where liars go. Revelation chapter 20. Note, this is a powerful passage speaking to the church. Two sections. In Revelation 20, we see the thousand years, and then we talk about the defeat of Satan. In this text, note verse 10. This is where the, the, uh, the Lord consumes them, the opposers of truth of God. And the devil, verse 10 of Re Revelation 20 says, and the devil who had deceived them, that is those who followed him, were thrown into the lake of fire. And they were tormented day and night forever. These, this final version are also tossed in. Verse 14 of chapter 20. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. This is judgment upon falsehood. False prophets will be there. They're doomed. So following false prophets leads to no good place. That's why we challenge people who are under the spell of an evil leader. They are in grave danger. It isn't just another view of something. It's dangerous. And that's why we say, no, you are under threat of damnation. Repent. Flee the wrath to come. Do not remain with this evil. So false prophets are doomed. They're not worthy of following. So the application, pray that our church leaders would regularly warn their congregations that false prophecy is a no-win strategy. Again, I want to read Acts chapter 20, 30 through 31. Jesus is, is, the, is the center of all of Paul. Christ is his Savior and Lord, and he's speaking with the authority from the Holy Spirit to the, to the uh, elders at Ephesus, and he speaks to us today, the whole church, and to Ephesus. And he says this, verse 28, I'll add a, few, a couple of verses, pay careful attention to yourselves and all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to care for the church of God which he obtained with his own blood. 
I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock, and from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore be alert, remembering that for three years I did not cease night or day to admonish everyone with tears and into the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who were sanctified. Notice this. Men will arise speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. <coughs> the, when God calls people into eldership, he calls them, bids them come and die because it's war. And it is a war that takes you by surprise. I recently just, uh, I just had an evening of struggle and sleep one night, but it was so good because I was able to stand in the wee hours from two o'clock till five in the morning and just be in the presence of God and just stand there and delight in who he is. Thank you for loving me. God Almighty. And I realize that um, the calling is difficult and it could bring us down. But even if we should die in our eldership role, we will come up because of Jesus. So pray that our church leaders would regularly warn their congregation that fall, congregations that following false prophets is no win strategy. Therefore, Stand. What should the church know about false prophets? The church should know that false prophets are disguised, detectable, and doomed. They're doomed. So let us warn. Just a few challenges. Then we're going to head to the hymn and then to our presentation of membership uh, <clears throat> candidates. Why do we put it near the end? Because preaching, teaching says this is who we are. This is who we are. And those who join, join the fellowship of the saints, and they join the elders, the deacons, the deaconesses, all the leadership, and everybody here. They join this group who stands united under the gospel banner and will not move, period. So here's some final challenges. Pray for a heart that self-examines. We too have flawed fruit. Every one of us, and it must be identified and seek the Lord for forgiveness. Flawed fruit. Seek it, identify it. Two, pray that the church might test carefully those who seek the position of vocational elder or pastor. The day is going to come, uh, and I've noticed this over the last years, that I'm just not as productive as I used to be, so I'm getting older. And so uh, shunt me off, but bring in some, someone younger and uh, can, can handle the war that is just intensifying. So you have to be careful. This past week I read this quote. I, I thought this applied to me. I was reading, reading on the Civil War and just got a book, Civil War, I enjoy it. And I was reading away. And uh, one, of the, one of the chapter headings uh, had this quote from Samuel Clemens. Samuel Clemens wrote this, when I was younger, I could remember anything, whether it happened or not. But as I grow older, it got so that I only remembered the latter. Great quote. And I thought, whoa. <laughs> I uh, get into that point. So anyway, test carefully, test carefully. Also, current elders, myself included, do not be afraid of seeking to awaken people in the face of danger. Uh-uh. Don't be afraid. This is that age. This is that age. Yeah, I, I look at this culture. It's bleh. how do you define this culture? Bleh. That's Latin, by the way. It's a, an old version of Latin. And this is uh, to the church in Sardis. To the church in Sardis and to the angel of the church in Sardis, write the words of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works. You have the reputation of being alive, but you're dead. Now, this is Jesus speaking to the church, but it's an example by the Holy Spirit to those who preach and teach. You follow suit. 
What does he say? Wake up. Strengthen what, is, what, is, uh, what remains and is about to die. For I have not found your works complete in the sight of my God. Remember then what you received and heard. Keep it and repent. If you will not wake up, I will come like a thief and you will not know at what hour I will come against you. So wake up, says the Lord. And we must not be afraid to challenge the church to awaken. It will be opposed. Oh, yeah. Whenever you take careful and prayerful stands, yet it must be done. That's why eldership will uh, take you and wear you down. All right, anyone who is an authentic elder is usually falling apart physically. Uh, you wake up one morning, your arm is on the floor. You say, oh, how'd that get there? I must have sneezed. So be prepared by the Holy Spirit. Stand firmly. It is by the Spirit of grace. We remember the gospel. What does the gospel teach us? Ah, it teaches us that through the glorious cross and the empty tomb, we have been died for. And Jesus lives for us, and he prays for us as from the right hand of the Father, interceding for us. And because of the gospel, we have the ability to keep going until he calls us home or he calls us into another aspect of ministry. He is the one, God. God in Christ, through the power of the Holy Spirit, he will take us home. We can rely on him. These things we cannot do in the flesh, but in the spirit. Yes, we can. And lastly, perhaps you are the one who struggles with truth. How about the exclusivity of Christ, which is always under attack in our culture? Oh, Christ is not the only way. And by the way, uh, Islam and Christianity, we worship the same God. Oh, is that true? Oh, no, it isn't. Uh, Islam does not uh, uh, hold up to the, uh, does not affirm the doctrine of the Trinity. Oh, so it's not the same God, right? <laughs> Absolutely not. They also do not believe that Jesus died on the cross. They do not believe that he is God. Uh, we do. So, no, no, no. Different. Uh uh. Christ is exclusive. Christ of the Bible, exclusive. And the leftists who tell us that, oh, oh, you know, we have to be loving. Uh, this person over here who's Buddhist, they will go to heaven too because God um, God just doesn't hate people. And what a powerful argument, eh? And I think to myself, no, baloney, baloney. Jesus is the only way. Exclusivity is under attack. Perhaps you have no Christ. Perhaps you're saying, well, Jesus, I don't know. I suppose if he's good enough for you, you can have him, but I don't have any room for him at this moment. By the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Hear this. John 14, verse 6. Hear this. We're going to close on this. We're going to sing a hymn. John 14, 6. Note. This is one of my favorite verses. Jesus speaking boldly. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. That's verse 1. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you? And I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again and will take to myself that where I am, you may be also. And you know the way to where I'm going. And Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we do not know where you're going. How can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one cometh unto the Father except through me. Ah, exclusivity. No one cometh unto the Father except through me. Therefore, I say to you today, by the Holy Spirit, if you have no Jesus, and therefore, if you think there are many ways to heaven, if I just do good and so many good things in life, it's good enough. No, that's a lie. He is the only way. And the call is to repent, to turn away from a life of sin, and to put your trust in Jesus Christ, who suffered, died, and rose again, that Christ, and you'll be saved. By the Holy Spirit, may this be so. Repent and trust in him. And now we're going to sing. And then we're going to meet our two candidates. God bless you.